Good morning. Oh. Hi, Dave. I can introduce you now. I'm sorry. I didn't see you because you were as um, you joined as an attendee, but oh, I apologize. Um, yes, no worries. Um, so I am pleased to announce. Dr. David Irwin, who is the principal investigator of the Penn Digital Neuropathology Lab and an attending cognitive neurologist in the Penn Frontal Temporal Degeneration Center. His research focuses on integrating histopathology and imaging methods in the, brain, in the human brain to develop and validate biomarkers based on gold standard histopathology with the overall goal of improving diagnosis to facilitate clinical trials for emerging emerging therapies for frontal temporal lobar degeneration and associated, associated neurodegenerative disorders. Please welcome Dr. Irwin as he discusses the topic, a career as a physician scientist, advice to my younger self. And I wanna remind everyone to please ask questions in the chat, any questions you might have. So thank you, Dave, for being here. You can start sharing your screen if you would like. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, it really is great to be here with everyone. Um, it's a wonderful program. It's so impressive uh, which you and your team have put together. Um, I hope to make this as informative and useful for the group. Um, so please ask questions and you know, I really would like to make this interactive. So um, hopefully my slides are coming through in full screen. Is that? Um... Yes, we can see them now, full screen. Perfect. So. Um, so we start with, you know, why to become a physician scientist? What are things that are good about this career path and what things are rewarding? And, you know, there's several, but to try to give a, you know, a, a rough list, you know, as careers in medicine in general, but especially for a physician scientist, it's a path of lifelong learning. Um, you're always working to improve your science, to improve your knowledge base and to be more creative and, uh, it is a really rewarding uh, career path. And um, there's also a lot of diverse activities. Your day is not always the same every single day. There's many things that you do, many things to balance and juggle as well. Um, but that integration of the clinical experience with uh, developing and testing research questions to try to improve that clinical experience uh, is very rewarding. And um, you know, patients teach you, uh, patients can, uh, by, examining and having clin good clinical skills and experience that really can help you shape the research questions you like to ask. And similarly, being part of a center or being part of a research program where you can inform your patients of the advances that you're making can help enhance your clinical care. And that can be true, especially in incurable diseases like neurodegenerative dementias that I specialize in, where we don't have many treatments that can slow or stop the disease. Um, but by being able to inform patients that we're doing cutting edge things to learn more about the biology that are working towards a cure um, is really therapeutic and rewarding. So um, that's an important part of the, the career path as well. Um, another important part is that you know, this really uniquely gives you intellectual independence and autonomy. Your lab as you develop it and you think about the types of research questions you'd like to ask and the types of things you'd like to work on are up to you. Um, that is really rewarding um, to have that type of autonomy and make decisions on what you think is important. And then as you gain uh, proficiency in your science and you make impacts in the field, people from around the country or maybe even around the world may be asking your opinions on how things should be done in terms of clinical trials or public policy. So you have a chance to make a real impact. And um, that's so important. And there really is a huge need for this. And the public service to patients. So doing NIH funded research, you're doing public service. This is research that's uh, funded by your peers, approved by your peers and paid for by taxpayer money. So it is uh, a big responsibility and, you know, to take that very seriously and be able to work towards the greater good for our society is also a very rewarding part of the job. Um, another part that I find especially rewarding is mentorship. I've been lucky to be helped along the way by several key mentors that really went above and beyond to help me. And um, when you think about building a lab and as you become more of a senior uh, investigator, I'm relatively junior, but as you become more senior, 
the lab becomes a, a fertile ground for ideas and resources. And your job is to build this area. You can direct the ship in big pictures, but then you want to encourage you know younger people to come in and take those ideas and go in different directions and start their own labs. And you know some of the most successful physician scientists and successful scientists have a large pedigree of people that they've trained that have made an impact. And um, you know, that's just so rewarding when one part of your job is to help make people be at their best and make them be successful and find their own way. So I think that um, that to me is one of the, the best parts of, of the physician scientist path. And finally, there's a huge societal need. Um, we'll talk about the pathway and what's involved. Um, and it's a long path, but it's a rewarding path. And every part of that pathway is really growth and that personal growth can be so rewarding. Sometimes um, it can be daunting and it can be overwhelming, the thought of more years of training. One of the things I like to emphasize at will is that your time is the most valuable resource as you develop your independent research plan. And um, what may seem like years as being a postdoc is actually the best spent time you can do to develop your science the best you can while your time is protected. And um, sometimes people who are really talented, who have great ideas, will decide not to go into academic medicine or become a physician scientist and uh, because it may seem overwhelming. They may have the impression that they can't spend time with their families. And, um, you know, it's just not the case. There's ways to balance your time and there's a big need for it. And the NIH has made many provisions to try to help make research careers accessible to junior faculty. There's an early investigator status where if you're applying for a grant uh, and you're short out of your time from training, you're essentially early stage and you haven't gotten your first R01 or your independent research grant. They uh, help lower the bar to make uh, those grants that are on the border of being funded, funded so that you don't have to wait the extra uh, few years to develop your science because you're competing against senior investigators. Um, there's also a loan repayment program and I'll talk more about that, but by doing a certain amount of clinical research, you're eligible to have uh, loan repayment through the NIH, which is so valuable because extended time as a trainee does have financial implications. And it's important that um, everyone who is interested and enthusiastic and wants to do this path should be able to do it. And financial um, you know, concerns are real, um, but there are ways to help alleviate that so that this is for everyone. And that's something I really want to emphasize too, is that if this is something that you want to do, it's really important to do it and everyone can do it and everyone who wants to do it should do it. So um, this is me in 1998. Uh, I had hair at the time. Uh, I look pretty happy. Uh, Dr. I, yes. Oh, sorry. Um, do you think you could change your audio from headphones to computer audio? It's a little bit weird um, at times. It sounds... Sure, uh, of course. Yeah. Maybe, um, I think it's maybe the earphones. So if you disconnect them, uh, and use your computer audio, I think it, it would sound a little bit more clear. Sure, how is that? Yes, that's great. Thank you so much. And sorry for the interruption. No, please let me know. I mean, if there's any, um, you know, technical things, please let me know. If there's questions, you know, I think, you know, we'll have the chat to track questions, but please feel free to, to let me know questions as we go through things. So um, I had to dig up a picture of me that was a a uh, photo, an actual photo, not a digital photo, and had to be scanned, um, which dates things a little bit. But uh, when Ali asked me to think of advice for my former self, I had to think back of what was I thinking when I was in your shoes and uh, what kind of things were important to me, what kind of things, you know, got me concerned or discouraging. Um, so I think that one of the things uh, for me was that this was very opaque, the whole system. How do I become a physician scientist? I had ideas that I liked to see, you know, clinical things. I did clinical experiences as an undergraduate. And I knew I liked research and I did some research as an undergraduate. Um, and I had this vague idea that I wanted to put them together, but I had no idea how to go about doing that. Um, so it's really important. So all of you on this call are light years ahead of where I was when I was in your shoes. I wouldn't even know to go find a resource like this to learn more. And hopefully I'm helping you uh, learn more about the process to encourage you to do this because everyone can do this. And if you'd like to do it, it's something that you wanna do. You should follow it, your dreams and, and do it. Um, similarly, another um, 
you know, important advice was to ask questions and read. If this person on this screen was in your class now, I probably would have been you know, nice to talk to, friendly. I wouldn't be raising my hand much. I was a little bit shy. Um, I would read for the exams and I, you know, I was a good student, but um, I didn't fully internalize what I was doing. And maybe that's a maturity thing. Um, but, you know, if it's good to read for the sake of reading. It's good to read and plan out what you'd like to do, but also being flexible as, as the future unfolds, you may find opportunities that weren't what you planned, but the more that you know about the content, you know about the field, that helps you a lot. And I'll, I'll give some themes and examples of that. And asking questions, I was always afraid to ask questions. Uh, I didn't wanna look dumb or look like I didn't understand things. Um, it, people who ask questions, you're more engaged, you learn more from that. There's no such thing, there really is no such thing as a bad question. And you know, uh, as you go along your training, another important thing that I learned is that you can't know everything and you shouldn't know everything. Um, academics, the depth of your knowledge is sometimes more valuable than the breadth of your knowledge. So if you, you know, for example, if I go to an imaging lecture, I may not know the basic, you know, I know the basic things about how to image the brain as a neurologist, but I might ask a basic level question, but I have depth in another area that can enhance the conversation. So instead of being self-conscious and saying, you know, I'm not sure I want to ask a question, it's okay. You know, it's better to be engaged. It's better to interact with your peers and with your teachers rather than, you know, being shy or self-conscious. So, you know, hopefully this is helpful to people. Uh, and knowing yourself, what are the things that you like to do? Um, what's, what do you value? What motivates you? This helps put you in the right place. A physician scientist career may not be for everyone. Um, or, you know, what could happen is it could be for someone, but they may not realize that they have the skills that, and the enthusiasm and, you know, in this area, and they can miss out on an opportunity. So, you know, what's also confusing is that your time changes. So when you're an intern, for example, in medicine, your life is very different than when you're an attending clinician. So if you don't like internship, part of this training path is that you do have to put up with some things that are uncomfortable for a while uh, that may not be your long-term goal. So things will change, but the more that you know about the pathway and what to expect, that really helps you because you don't want to miss an opportunity because you say, well, I don't really like, you know, doing this in the lab. Um, but you may not be pipetting for the rest of your career, but that experience of pipetting and doing wet lab early will help you. Um, it will be difficult at times. I think at times when I had periods that were really challenging where I wasn't sure I was gonna make it, um, at times I just would realize that it's supposed to be difficult. This is a hard path, but it's a very rewarding path and not to let the difficulty cause stress. The stress can start to, uh, get in the way of you being productive. And that's what, uh, what I call the sweet spot of stress. Enough stress to keep you motivated uh, and keep you moving forward is important. But if stress starts to become overwhelming, where you, it's, you find yourself procrastinating and you find yourself ruminating over things that are worrisome to you about whether it's an exam or a paper that you need to write or your performance on the ward, the bottom line is those things won't happen for you, these advances in your career, unless you work hard. And if the stress is getting in the way of you working at your best, then there's a problem. And finding these outlets, you can have a rewarding life. It's a hard, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, but um, no one works 24 hours a day. No one should work 24 hours a day. And it's important to maintain those things that are important to you at every stage, whether it's a medical student, whether you're faculty, and, um, you know, there's a certain diminishing returns if you're working for, you know, if you're studying for six hours straight, at some point, you're less efficient than you were in the beginning. You're better off doing chunks of maybe two hours at a time where you can be focused. So, you know, getting a hold of stress, I think, was something that, you know, maybe I could have done better. Um, another thing is it's really important to take advice. Mentorship is critical. And I'll talk about that and give examples. Um, you know, having people who can help you uh, be at your best and find your path is really important. Uh, at the same time, your mentors can only tell you what they, what you tell them about what you want. So, you know, it's important also to think somewhat independently. Um, you know, it's good. It's, you should take advice, especially from mentors that, are, you know, you trust, but also, you know, thinking about what's important to you is good too. And I'll give some examples of that. And 
you know, another key aspect to this is that time is really your most valuable asset. When you are training and you're developing your research question and your research path, um, it takes time. You have to develop skills. You have to develop a knowledge base. You have to develop a body of work. I'll talk to you about what's called an elevator speech, which is when you're in an elevator with a department chair at a conference. What's your two-line summary of your research program? Uh, for me, it took about 10 years to get that, and it's still, I'm tweaking it. Um, so you need that time to develop as a scientist and as a clinician. So sometimes it can feel like you're in training for a long time and you'd like to be an independent faculty, but the payoff of really getting those skills um, while you can is important. Um, advice that was given to me at one point, which I thought was excellent, is that it, as a physician scientist, um, it's easier to go from web bench science to clinical research where you're analyzing data. And in general, in, in medicine, it's easier to go in most disciplines, but it depends on the discipline, easier to go from academia to private practice, but it's tougher to go the opposite directions. And the reason for that is early in your career, having this protected time where you can really develop your science, develop your skill set uh, is critical. And if you miss out on these opportunities or maybe, you know, say, well, I've been a fellow for two years. I really like to get that attending salary, which is an important issue not to minimize financial things, but there are loan repayments and other, other ways to help offset this. But getting that protected time up front is really important because um, as a faculty position, your faculty position will often have to reflect some method of uh, supporting your salary, whether that's clinical time or research grants, and it can take time to get the research grants. So having that time protected early so that your clinical uh, load isn't too heavy is important. And then another really important thing that I think is enjoying the trip. You know, this is a pathway. There's so many steps involved, USMLE step one, two, and three, and, uh, and so on. We can often look to the future, but it's important to enjoy every step that you're at. You guys are in an exciting time where you're planning to apply to medical school or you're thinking about applying to medical school and you may be a little as an undergraduate or even as a high school student. Enjoy this. Sometimes you can feel overwhelmed if you go to a lab meeting and people are talking about things that you might not know about. That's okay. You're not supposed to know about it yet, but you know, try to read, try to just enjoy every part of it because it actually really goes very quickly. Uh, so it's important. So my path um, to getting my own lab and doing translational research, uh, I think of my path as kind of like an amoeba. Um, amoebas aren't very smart. They function on a very simple principle. If they see something they like or they detect something they like, they gravitate towards it. Um, if there's something that they don't like, they retract back from it and they kind of meander around. And with a little bit of luck, they'll get to their goal and they'll get some food or whatever they need, um, you know, essentially get to the end point. And that, that is my path. I would like to say that I had everything well planned and that I, you know, knew exactly what I was doing. Uh, I'd say I was more focused on big picture. And in some ways, that is a very advantageous thing. And I think that in some ways, the amoeba way of going through your career is valuable because if you ignore what's important to you and you ignore what you like, you may not be happy with your career path or you may miss something that's really rewarding. Uh, at the same time, I think it's better to be a smart amoeba where you have some idea of the landscape and you help you gravitate towards things uh, that you like. So, you know, I would suggest the other advice piece is to try to be a, you know, a smart amoeba, but don't ignore those uh, feelings when you feel like this is something I enjoy. Um, don't close those doors. So. Um, my path started when I was in your shoes as a rejection to my first round of medical school applications. I was a senior in college. I was doing my applications lackadaisical, um, thinking back to my essays. If I remember, I might have wrote that I was excited to go to a city and you know, do medicine. And you know, I was, but I wasn't mature enough at the time in retrospect. And I, I had an interview where um, I really got grilled on managed care and, and complex things of healthcare delivery on a societal level. And I remember being really, you know, disappointed that I had a tough interview. And, and looking back, I think that I, I just wasn't mature enough for medical school at that point. And it probably showed in my interactions and in my interview. 
And, you know, though that interview style I may not agree with, I think it was a good learning experience that, you know, I need to be informed. I need to be more integrated in the path that I'm choosing rather than, you know, the big picture idea of I want to be a scientist, I want to be a doctor. Um, so I ended up doing a post back program for a year and reapplying to medical school. And during that program, I was able to do more clinical work, get a feel for what medical school was really about. Um, it was helpful to, to get a certain level of maturity before going into medical school. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a research project that I did in medical school. I think that it's important to try to be involved in, in a lot of if you want to do physician scientist work, and it can take all different forms. And you know, in your clinical training in medical school and in residency, it's very hard to do high level research, but you can get onboarded early, would be my advice. Try to get to, into a level of know the people, know where to find things. And then when you have these pockets of elective time or more um, light rotations, you can make the most of it and be productive. And um, not all good research ends in a first author paper. I think there's a lot of pressure for ac um, acceptances, whether it's residency or medical school, to, you know, to have your name on a paper. Um, what impresses me more in trainees or people applying is that they can talk about the research because you know research is you know there are things that fail and that's probably another good piece of advice is that failure happens and it's not necessarily bad uh, failure makes you better you have to refocus and, and try something new rather than trying the same thing over again over again that may not uh may not work and you know if you're in a lab as a resident or a medical student and you got a first author paper and you worked hard, that's terrific and not to minimize that, but there's many people who are really talented who work hard and that may not happen for many reasons that have nothing to do with the trainee. So there is a little element of luck of having a, a paper published and that's you know, not always the, the strongest biomarker in my opinion. Um, you know, it's being able to talk about the science, how are you integrating the lab? In general, people are looking for, um, did you become a leadership? position? Did you become a leader during your time? Did you start in a lab and maintain that uh, experience throughout your college career, your medical student career? And then were you training junior members? You know, what was your role in the lab? And um, so just to help put that in perspective, um, there are many things that could be very productive and good, even if they don't end up in a paper. Um, so I'm a neurologist at the neurology residency, which is one year of internal medicine, three years of, of neurology and clinical neurology and it's a time you know we'll talk about a little bit where you can really develop your clinical skills and start to get your question um you know for me i'll give the example but you you know you find a question that interests you clinically but then you can start to think about well how do i want to answer that question what's this clinical problem that bugs me that fascinates me and how can i solve this my clinical practice would be so much better if i could do x y or z then you have to think well well how can i solve it um, I did a behavioral neurology fellowship with also neuropathology, and I was actually hired by a neuropathology lab, even though I'm not a neuropathologist, to do research. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how that works. Um, there are many roads to physician scientists. I think you've had sessions on MD, PhD, and you can do MD, PhD and get great research training during your clinical training. Um, other ways are to get research training after your residency. And that, that was my path. And I think um, it's just different depending on the types of research you do. I did a master's in translational research program as part of my fellowship, which helped extend it. It was four years of fellowship, but I had lots to learn. I had to learn how to do neuropathology. As a non-neuropathologist, I had to learn behavioral neurology and how to do a cognitive exam. Uh, I had to learn how to frame hypotheses, write grants, write papers, do statistics. So the, there was a lot to learn and that four years was critical and this master's program gave some formal structure uh, that helped me, um, you know, go on to write grants and, and to transition to faculty. There's something called the K Award. The K Award is through the NIH and what it does is gives you five years of mentored research. So your lab is based out of your mentor's lab. You're not independent yet, but you have um, five years to develop a research program that will be independent. And you can learn anything you want to learn. You can, and you develop a team of people who help you. It's just fantastic. It's so exciting because you can get five years to develop your research program and you have a scientific question and there's a grant that goes with it on the science and you have to develop the science to match your career goals. So that was the beginning of my, um, we have an instructor level, which is kind of a transition level to faculty and then assistant professor. 
um, about five years ago, in which I've been uh, really lucky and privileged to have I did got independent funding and now have my own lab. So um, the, these paths will look different depending on your clinical specialty and your interest. This is just one way of going about it. And again, I kind of fell into a very lucky situation where I had mentors who really cared about my well being and I worked very hard uh, and did things that I liked and that I was good at. And, um, you know, that's the thing. If uh, I'll give examples about if things aren't fit, how you can pivot and change. So how do I spend my time and what's a career as a research uh, faculty? Clinic is 20% of what I do, uh, one full day a week with patients. And that may not seem like a lot, but um, it is um, uh, really a core part of what I do. And for my work and seeing dementia patients, spending a full day with patients and getting the time to spend an hour with a new patient and, 30 minutes or more with follow-ups, I can really do the clinical care that I, that I really think is necessary and take the time, uh, as well as having research to offer patients. And we do clinical trials, which is part of this clinical trial. We're testing therapeutics, so it's very rewarding. And it's very synergistic with my research program. The patients that I uh, see in clinic often do research that participate in biofluids and imaging and, um, and ultimately brain donation, which is a part of my program. So they're not at odds with each other, they actually enhance each other. And I think that that model is many people follow. And I think that is a powerful way to be a clinician scientist where your clinical skills are driving your research question and your clinical time is not a distraction, but actually making your research better and, and vice versa. Um, teaching is, uh, I do lectures for medical students, residents, it's spread out throughout the year. Um, I organize the cognitive lectures for our uh, residents. so. Um, about 5% of the total time, but teaching is also in the lab. So it's really rewarding. I can do clinical teaching, but also a big part of what I do is meeting with mentees in my lab and helping them develop their scientific skills. Um, we have lab meetings, data analysis, paper and grant writing. That's the bulk of what I do. Um, I do do experiments from time to time, but mostly it's my team now as a primary investigator. I've done the work before, I know what's involved. Um, but now it's time to train people in my lab to do those experiments and to build on them and to grow. And my job now is to see where the lab should go and to um, help develop new techniques that can make us better and, um, and so forth. And then administrative time, I'm on the IRB and some academic committees. It's important to be a part of the uh, department and a part of the school and you know, help contribute to um, those aspects of academia too. So in uh, academic medicine, how you spend your time develops depends in part on how your funding levels are. So, um, you know, getting this protected time, you need the grant money to support your ability to stay in the lab. And that's why your uh, protected time early in your career is really critical. So uh, I was on something called a T32, which is a training grant from my mentor, which protected 80% of my time to do research. It was fantastic because I needed to develop those skills. So I had uh, four and a half days a week plus the weekends to really dig in and do research and immerse myself in research. Uh, I'll skip through this briefly because I want to make sure we have time to chat and to talk. Uh, but my research is about a form of young onset dementia where clinically we have a definition of the disease and it's corresponds to atrophy in the brain. But when we look at the brain even grossly, we can't tell what the actual disease is. And there's two very different proteins that accumulate in the brain and two very different functions of these proteins and treatments will be very different as they're developed. So the diagnosis and the differentiation of these proteins is really important. So my lab um, is at the autopsy side of things. We look at brain tissue and we can relate clinical data and imaging and spinal fluid during life to not only validate what was collected, I think the final answer was it the tau protein or the TBP43 protein, but we can start to make new biomarkers to diagnose uh, based on what we see under the microscope. And we look at pathology in a different way. We borrow disciplines from spinal fluid imaging and MRI and how we study pathology. So I'm different than neuropathologists, I'm different than neurologists who see patients. And that was how I started to form my research niche. And it's, it's important to think about later in your career is how are you different from other researchers? How would you stand out in the field? And, how, and you, how do you be really novel? So we try to really integrate imaging and pathology in a new way. Um, 
how did I get here as a resident? Clinical exam in neurology really spoke to me. The classic neurologic exam could locate where in the brain a patient had a lesion, even if they were comatose in these classic texts. He was a medical student I just hung to. I was excited. This was really cool. I thought it was amazing. You know, the, um, you know, Oliver Sacks types of analyses and um, was just exciting to me. And it, as you go through medical school, it's a really fun time when your friends start to differentiate, you know, a friend who likes orthopedics really gets into their reading about, you know, how to set different fractures and so on. And, um, you know, you want to have that moment in your medical school, where you, you pick your subspecialty and something, you know, a good barometer for that, or what are the books that, you know, what are the shelf exams that you, you know, you can't put the book down rather than, um, others that are, you know, you just not really speaking to you. So I knew I wanted to do neurology. I had an interest in neuroscience and understanding, you know, cognition. And um, then I had a patient who really was illustrative to me. So this was a drawing from a patient who um, had never had art, artistic ability before, but then started drawing these beautiful pictures um, and had some disinhibited behavior where they were in public and taking people's napkins off uh, restaurants and drawing these beautifully elaborate pictures and was eventually diagnosed with the frontotemporal dementia, this behavioral type of dementia. And at the same time, this is from a study from UCSF, there were descriptions of patients who had this dementia that affects really one side of the brain. And if you have disease in one side of the brain, the theory was that you could release creativity and actually enhance new skills in the setting of a degenerating brain. And to me, that was just so interesting and fascinating. Uh, that I knew that this was a disease I really wanted to study. Um, I want to give enough time, so I'll go quickly, but you know, I did have a dead-end research project, quote unquote. When I was a medical student, I was at a neurology interest group. I knew I wanted to do neurology. There was a great talk by a PhD scientist about ALS and some of the overlap of motor neuron disease with FTD. Um, and um, I did something that I usually don't do. I went up and talked to the lecturer afterwards. And these are the types of things I think you guys should be doing. It was really a key part of my career path, I think, because after speaking with him, um, I was able to meet with a neurologist who sees ALS patients. And we designed a study to look at cognition in the mouse model of ALS. And I did this research pay, uh, project as a, uh, a medical student. It was during electives and off hours. I was putting these mice in a Morris water maze. And some of the mice froze and it ends up that that strain of mouse outside of the ALS mutation can sometimes freeze in the, um, in the pool. And we didn't know that at the time. And essentially all the data was useless and nothing happened. It was a lot of work, you know, mouse husbandry going back and forth, carting them, uh, no papers, no abstracts, but it was, really, really important. One, I learned that I didn't like animal work. Uh, two, I learned that I did a big literature review. I showed up to the, uh, the neurologist whose lab it was with a big stack of papers that I put in a binder and organized to read ahead. And, um, you know, she was very impressed with that. And I think it was helpful to me to really get a foundation. What's the field? What's going on in this area? And where can I start to find my, um, my niche? And even though I didn't really conceptualize it that crisply the idea of starting to build this background in a field and getting immersed in the field. So then you can start to sort out in an amoeba-like way, what is good for you. And residency, you know, your focus is really on your clinical skills, getting your clinical experience. So you can focus your research questions. Um, you can still be academically productive. So if there's a case report, an interesting case in the wards, you know, talk to your, your attending, write it up. You write reviews, retrospective chart papers. You know, heavy duty basic science papers are hard to do as a resident, um, but you can still start to build an academic base in those things. The more that you write, the more that you do, you know, I guess another good piece of advice would be every academic experience, whether um, you feels like it at the moment or not, is something that really helps you move forward. So a grant that is not funded, you learn from writing the grant and it's disappointing, but the fact is that everyone gets grants rejected and you know the hit rate of a grant for most people is you know a third at best you know your grants get rejected but it makes you better every time you write it you're focusing your thoughts you're getting better and in this case you know these research projects that may not hit the end goal that you want you're still learning from them it's really important 
Um, this was an example of in when I was in medical school, it used to be the test question would be ALS was upper motor neuron problems or lower motor neuron problems or both, but it wasn't dementia. And then in uh, around the time when I was going to fellowship, there was this, it was discovered that the same protein, this TDP43 protein was in ALS and FTD. So all of a sudden the exam question was actually wrong that I had learned in dementia and the overlap of this behavioral dementia that I mentioned and the very different, seemingly different clinical syndrome of ALS, we think of a motor disease, were actually linked by the same biology and very different from these patients who had tau protein. So this just blew my mind. I was just, you know, I thought this was so interesting. And um, I knew that I wanted to be in the area and I wanted to be in the lab of, of John Chorginowski and Virginia Lee to really understand what was happening under the microscope in these patients. I didn't have a good plan of how I would go about that, but I just knew this is where I wanna be. These are the people that do the work and I wanna just be in this environment. And it was just so wonderful. Um, I wanna leave some questions uh, for you guys. So I'll just speed through this a little bit. But, you know, because this is more down the road, but thinking of your postdoc, when you're early years, you want to immerse in the field, you want to get the specialized research expertise, you want to complement that to your clinical experience, and it's good to network by being helpful. Someone in the lab has questions like, you know, they're maybe a PhD scientist that needs to know more clinical data, help them out, and you'll learn from them. And your peers are also a great, you know, in the lab and in other, you know, collaborating labs are a great, great way to help uh, grow your program. And it's a good idea to say the yes to everything uh, early. You know, later in your career, things may, uh, you may have competing interests for certain commitments, but things that are academically productive and your good mentors give you good things to do. Could you write this uh, editorial with me? Uh, could you give this talk here? These opportunities, if you do a good job being a good mentee, the more opportunities will open for you. So it's a good idea and you learn from all of these. So at times it could be feeling overwhelming. How could I get that done? But then if you, you know, you do it, you, you grow and you get better. Uh, when to change directions. So if you're not happy, but it's important to think of why you're not happy. You know, is this something that you don't want to do or you just, it's a tough time period where, you know, internship or, you know, being a junior postdoc is, challenging to pipette all day, but then you're gonna not always have to do that. You know, so is it still down the road something that'll be rewarding? Um, you know, again, if it doesn't lead to a clear career path. And for me, I was doing an animal work when I was a postdoc uh, and I liked it, but I couldn't see myself having an animal colony and having that type of program where I was doing mechanism. And I talked to my mentor who was extremely supportive and told me, you know, that, that is okay and that makes sense and let's, get some projects for you that are more translational with human brain tissue and really help uh, foster that interest that I have. So, you know, if I didn't speak up, my mentor would have no idea. My mentor is wonderfully supportive uh, and it's okay to bring up these types of things because, you know, they're there to help you. And that's why a really good mentorship will help you make these decisions and get you on the path that is rewarding to you. Um, then later in your fellowship years, it's important to start to think of your vision statement, what your little will look like, what are the things you want to do for your core skills, and who do you want to collaborate. These are things way down the road for you guys, but good to start to think about. And then how to focus your research plan. Again, you know, saying yes to scientific opportunities, writing grants and papers, thinking about what are the core skills of your level and identifying the collaborators that enhance your program. You can't be an expert on everything. And it, doesn't make sense to recreate the wheel. If you have a collaborator who does great, you know, for me, it's imaging. I'm not a neuroimager, but I have wonderful collaborators who are really good at this that I work with and um, we're both better for it. So it's just you know, a terrific way to start to build your program. Um, you know, and this is an example of how I pivoted my research program. I'll just go quickly through this, but my original K award was to, I wanted to clinically redefine the behavioral variant to reflect these two different proteins that accumulate in the brain pitfall was that it was difficult to do with the retrospective data that I had. And I realized that if I really wanted to do that, that would be a total different direction. Um, but I really liked autopsy tissue and looking at microscopic pathology. Um, so, you know, I still am in the same area, but I really took this area that I was a little bit afraid to jump in because I'm not a neuropathologist by clinical training, but I had wonderful support by neuropathology mentors that helped me Say it's okay that this is my area of research and it really has been rewarding and wonderful and you know, now I do all kinds of things where we're integrating imaging pathology. 
So I'll leave this up. Um, these are some pearls of how to be a physician scientist that are more for down the road when you're in a late residency fellowship and negotiating a faculty position. Uh, many of these themes I've mentioned throughout the talk, but I want to make sure I give time to, to answer questions. So, um, but most important, don't give up. Rejection in this area is frequent. It's not personal when people reject a paper or even the example when I had a difficult, um, you know, medical school interview. It was for my own good. I wasn't mature enough. You know, it's good to do some introspection and, you know, try not to be too defensive. Uh, it's a healthy thing to take critique criticism and critique and then come back better. That's the best, uh, the way to move forward. So um, I hope this is helpful. It's really important that if you guys have an interest in this area that you pursue it, um, there's a huge need for it. So I really uh, look forward to answering your questions. And, um, you know, and, and again, thank you to Ali and, and everyone for inviting me this morning. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. As your undergrad student in your lab and someone who really admires you, I'm really grateful that I had the chance to hear your story and also share it to other students out there who are considering um, this career path. So now, if you want, um, we can stop sharing your screen and um, I'll start with some of the Q&A questions we had. Perfect. I know, I wish there was time I would show off your work, Ali, the great work you've done in the lab. Um, can you hear me? I had a brief freeze in the... Um, yeah, there were some technical difficulties, um, but we're back again. Uh, the only thing is that I had to, like the webinar closed, so now some of our questions were lost. So I'm sorry, participants, um, if you could please ask your questions again, um, that would be great so that I can ask them to Dr. Irwin. Um, and let's start. I think the question that I had seen before is, um, how were you able to do research um, as just an MD with an MD degree? And sure. Um, and I can see the questions too. So that's helpful, Ali. I, if you, they're not visible to you, I can go through them. Yeah. Um, so let me know. But yeah, so that, you know, you can do research as an MD and people will ask me, you know, do you, is there a difference between MD, PhD and MD? And how do you do research as an MD? Um, you know, there are, it's slightly different. And the advice that, that I tell people is that if you'd like to do mechanistic work, like if you want to have you know, highly demanding technical skills like um, animal work, cell culture, these types of things, then the MD PhD really helps you tremendously because you get that training. You can pause for a few years during your clinical training as a medical student and develop those skills so that when you are a postdoc or, you know, a fellow, you can then dive in and really enhance those skills with a clinical question. Um, for me, I, I don't do mechanistic work but we do work that helps us with diagnosis and identify therapeutic targets. And I work with people who have, you know, do that type of work. So I'm more translational. Um, and we could talk about the definitions of translational, that's helpful. But, um, you know, I did all my research training at the postdoc level and really starting in residency, starting to write papers and learning, you know, that aspect of it. But the formal research training started in my clinical postdoc. And I should say it also depends a little bit on your clinical background. As a behavioral neurologist, there's, um, you know, at the time there was no formal ACGME fellowship because um, it's different than, say, cardiology, where you have certain requirements to be a cardiologist and your fellowship, you have a certain amount of hours of doing things. So, in those types of fields, the fellowship, you usually do a few years of clinical training and maybe do some research on the side, and then you add a, you know, a few years of research training afterwards. So, um, you know, and again, I use the master's program. Many There's master's in epidemiology at many schools. I did master's in translational. That was more um, about, you know, web bench science and, and imaging and so forth. But there's ways to get that training after your clinical training. And there's no one way that's better than the other. There's just slight differences. But as far as in academia, no one looks any different at someone who has an MD, PhD compared to an MD or in that matter, a PhD without an MD in some cases of people who do really clinical work. Um, it's all very similar. It's really you do the work that you do and doing good work. So hopefully that helped answer that question. 
Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, if you want, I, I can see some of the questions that were just asked. So another good one is, um, do you have tips to develop your elevator pitch? Sure. Um, practice, you know, practice in front of the mirror, in front of your friends, in front of your parents, anybody who will listen to you. Um, one of the things with scientific writing that's kind of interesting is that the shorter things you need to write are sometimes the hardest thing, like a specific aims page, one page to say what you're going to do for five years is really hard to fit it on one page. But as you mature your ideas, um, that becomes easier. So for the elevator pitch, um, think about who you are, what's your research, what do you do, and how is it important, and that helps you. So for me, I say I'm a cognitive neurologist and experimental neuropathologist that studies uh, underlying pathology of neurodegenerative disease to develop new biomarkers and, and um, therapeutic targets. And, you know, that took me years and I'm still, you know, tweaking it. But um, a pearl of advice that's related to this is that the more that you develop these big picture themes and you, know, you think about what your research program is gonna be like, it helps you when you're negotiating for a faculty position or if you're trying to you know, get resources for your labs, if you can clearly communicate what is it you do and why is it important to other people, that really helps you build. A department chair may be very supportive, but if they don't know exactly what the work that you plan on doing, it's hard to really give you that help. Um, so I think the more that you read, the more that you write, and the more that you practice, these, you know, themes and crystallize into a succinct kind of elevator pitch. And it's okay if you don't have, you know, it takes a few years to really develop it. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, next question. What is your best advice regarding finding good mentors? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, everyone has a different style and people, um, you know, in general, I would say a bad mentor is rare. Um, it, it really is. Most people who go into academia are really that part of the career that's helping people get better is a big rewarding part of what they do. So I think by and large people um, that you would encounter to work in a lab are going to be very supportive, but it's important that you find mentors that are you're compatible with. We're all different. We all have different communication styles. So learning your mentor's communication style. Um, and in general, signs of a good mentor are, do they give you opportunities that are good for you? You know, sometimes opportunities could maybe be distracting or, you know, but if it doesn't seem like it's a good opportunity for you. So for example, they may say, you know, I want you to TA this class or something. Or you might say, well, I have all this lab work to do. Why am I going to go teach? It seems like it's contradictory. It's good to talk to them about it and then find out there may be something in there that is good for you that may not be apparent to you right away. So communication with mentorship is really, really important. And if you find that, you know, mentorship is or communication is not working where you're bringing things up that you have concerns and you're not getting something that's helping, um, you know, that might be a sign that you, a different mentor may be a better fit for you. Um, it's also important to know that as a mentee, you have to be sensitive to your mentor's you know, communication style. Maybe your mentor is in clinic, you know, twice a week, and, or maybe they're an email person where they really get back to you on email, but it's hard for them to really get on the phone with you or be in person. So um, trying to, you know, fit their patterns of communication, get back to them quickly. You know, as a mentor, one of the, you know, worst things to happen is to invest in someone and have them, you know, fall off the radar and have a project, you know, fall in the ether and, and not go forward. Um, so, you know, it's good to have some introspection too. And if you have a mentor relationship, you're not sure working out, start to think about, is there something that I'm doing that could make this better? Am I, you know, communicating well? So I think that's one aspect. And then finding labs that, you know, are these the papers you're reading? Is this the stuff that you're interested in? You know, always think of like, what are the, the things that you can't put down when you're reading? And then you want to go, I want to go to that lab. That person's doing the stuff that I want to do. All right. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. So if actually, could you read any questions that you would like from the Q&A? Because most of mine disappeared, unfortunately. Sure, um, so I see one that says, how are you willing to accommodate uh, undergraduate students in your lab and how is a student likely to gain a position in your lab? Um, so I do, um, most labs do. The um, you know, we understand as PIs that undergraduates have many demands and it's hard um, to 
you know, really focus on research for certain aspects unless they're part of a, a thesis. And, you know, um, most PIs will participate in different programs at institutions that accelerate undergraduates participating in, in research. And um, often we pair undergraduates with um, postdocs or graduate students who have more experience so that they can help, you know, help you along. So the best way to, to do it is to really, you know, look into the kind of stuff that you're interested in, find a lab that sounds interesting and write to the PI, you know, don't be shy. Um, you know, if they have, if they don't have room, if they, you know, they'll tell you, or if they may even offer say, well, I don't have room, but um, my part, my collaborator who does X, Y, and Z, you know, may, and I can forward your CV. So, um, I would say two things. One, try to get involved with programs at your institution that may help facilitate undergraduate research. And two, you can't go wrong with a cold call email as well. Um, as an undergraduate, if you would like to change your research interests, which labs, how would you go doing it while maintaining a positive relationship with your past PI? Everyone understands um, that you have to do what's right for you. And I think that communication is important. I think your PI and how you would switch and how you would leave is a big part of things. So if you have open communication with your PI that says, hey, I really appreciate everything you've done for me and everything in the lab. I want to finish my commitments with you, but I also, in my development, I need to learn X, Y, and Z. Um, I'd like to switch labs they can work with you and they may even help you find a lab to fit in. People want, you know, in general, people really want the best for all their trainees and that not, doesn't always align with what's best for their individual lab, but most people can really see that and appreciate that. So I think communication and being respectful, if you abruptly, you know, if you drop off the radar unannounced and, you know, leave projects half done, that may be more of a concern for someone but be, to be less receptive. But if you're you know, finish your commitments or find a way to transition your commitments, um, I think that would be well received. All right. Um, I think it's time to transition to our lunch break, but thank you so much, Dr. Irwin, for joining us today. Um, I learned a lot from your presentation and I'm sure our students did too. So thank you for sharing your story. Sure, thank you. And congratulations on a really wonderful program and uh, event. So uh, take care. All right, bye. Bye. All right, so we will jump into our next presentation in about five minutes, so don't go anywhere. <laughs>